Hello, my name is Erica Smith. Today's date is Friday, March 22nd, 2019. I am interviewing Kathy Maniachi on Ball State campus as part of the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project. Thank you, Kathy, for agreeing to participate in this effort, mm -hmm. which we are conducting during this, the Honors College's 60th year anniversary. So I would like to begin by learning a little bit more about your upbringing. All right. And where and when were you born? I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I have to tell you the year, huh, so that you know how old I am, in 1957. 1957. In June 1957. And then how would you describe your family experience as you were growing up? <laughs> I have... Um, I have four brothers and a sister, and so, and I'm the oldest. So growing up, there was always lots of things going on in the house, and with four brothers, it was, it was me, then the four brothers, then my sister. So I was always waiting for a girl in the family, didn't come for a long time. But um, my sister and I are 14 years apart in age, and my sister is born, was born with spina bifida. So she's in a wheelchair and um, has to be taken care of by my had to be taken care of by my parents the whole time. So growing up, we were always we did everything as a family. Um, we were always taking vacations. We took my dad had a job where he had a week off every summer, and we always knew that that week we would go find some cottage on a lake somewhere, and we would pack up the whole family in the station wagon and go on vacation. And so it was pretty much um, a typical family life. My, my mom didn't work. My dad did work. He came home every day at the same time. And um, we all went to school in the neighborhood. We all walked to school. And um, like I said, there were four brothers and a sister, and it was a little bit crazy. I can imagine. It was a little bit crazy. And then what were your parents' names? My mom's name was Jean, and my dad's name was Jim. And what did they do as their occupation? My mom stayed home okay. and stayed home with the kids, with all of us. Mm -hmm. And my dad worked for Bell Telephone. And he started out, and it's AT&T now, but he started out, it was Bell of Pennsylvania, and he started out by collecting coins out of the pay phones that used to be at all the gas stations and along the, the roads. And so he started out doing that and then he moved into sales and then moved into management. So he always worked in downtown Pittsburgh and then, like I said, pretty much went to work at eight o'clock in the morning and came home at 5.30 in the afternoon. Okay. And then how would you describe your ed educational experience growing up? Um, well, it was, I mean, it was typical education. Mm -hmm. It was, um, the elementary school was down the street and around the corner, so you pretty much knew. Oh, and I also grew up on a street that had um, a Catholic church at the bottom of it. And so everybody in the neighborhood was Catholic, so everybody had tons of kids. So there were six, seven, eight kids in different families. There were 11 kids in one family down the street, and there were 13 kids in one family up the street. So everybody on the street went to school in the neighborhood school, so we all walked together down the street, went to the elementary school. When we went to um, middle school, that actually was right next to the elementary school because it was a suburb of Pittsburgh at that time. And so everybody was moving out into the suburbs. So it was pretty, neighborhoods were building up, but it was still pretty quiet. So there was one elementary school, there was one middle school, and there was one high school. So pretty typical education. You went to the elementary school in your neighborhood, you went to the middle school, mm -hmm. you went to the high school. There weren't a whole lot of choices. You basically went to school where you were supposed to go to school and everybody from the neighborhood went to the same school. That's awesome. And then was there anything about your elementary education that stood out to you as you were growing up? Anything that you were interested in that kind of carried on? Not really. I mean, it's typical mm -hmm. elementary school education. And then, um, Middle school, I, I thought it was exciting because elementary school, we were always in the same room um, for if you were in first grade, third grade, fifth grade, you never changed classes till you got to middle school and that was kind of fun because then you got to change rooms and have different classes in middle school. And then high school was, um, you know, and then high school was the, was the typical high school, but people had to come from all over to the high school because it was the only one. And so, um, it was 
that was interesting because it was very small. When I gra graduated from high school, I graduated with 82 kids. Oh, wow. 82 students, yep. And then you attended Peters Township High School in Murray, Pennsylvania from 1971 to 1975, correct? I did. Mm -hmm. okay. And then... Did religion have any impact on your upbringing as you grew up? Because you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, um, I think it did because um, we had to do, um, we, were, we were Catholic as well. So mm -hmm. we ha went to church every Sunday or Saturday night. I was um, part of the choir at church. So um, I, I played the guitar and I was part of the choir in church. And so by doing that, then... You went to church, and then you went to what we called CCD, which was Catholic education. You did that after church. And that was every, you know, if you went to church on Saturday, you went to CCD on Sunday. If you went to church on Sunday, you stayed for CCD. And, um, and so it was really much a part of every weekly, every weekly thing that we did. And because I was in the choir, then I was in the youth group, and I was in the different, you know, um, service organizations that were a part of the church. So I would tell you that the church, not true Catholic religion per se, but the church had a lot to do with my social life. In addition to what was going on at school, a lot of things happened you know, through the church group. So um, that had that impact. Okay. And then you attended Ball State and completed your bachelor's degree in nursing from 1975 to 1979. I did. And what brought you to Ball State from Pennsylvania? Okay, so this is a really funny story. In my, I have I have two daughters, and they both went to college, and they were trying to figure out where they were going to go to school. So they asked, "How did I get to Ball State?" So I'm old, and <laughs> um, so I when I took the SATs, there was a little question at the top of the. It was a Scantron sheet. And there's a little question at the top that said, would you like to get information from schools? If, um, and of course you pick yes, so that you can get all the um, brochures and pamphlets and everything from all the schools. And depending on how well you did on the SATs, of course, depended on what type of school sent you stuff. But um, I always knew I wanted to be a nurse. And maybe it was because I had a sister who was handicapped, but I really always wanted to be a nurse. And um, so, I was looking for nursing school for, for colleges, and I knew I should probably do the four-year degree because I figured if I'm going to go to college or I'm going to go to school for nursing, I might as well just do it all at once and get the bachelor's of science degree. So I was looking at different schools that had nursing programs. So I looked at Penn State, and I looked at Pitt um, because that was in Pittsburgh, and that was in Pennsylvania, and those were in-state tuitions, obviously. And so I was the oldest. I was the first one going to college. And so um, I had to look at how much it was going to cost and how we can make that work. And it was really, um, so I looked at a bunch of different schools. I looked at schools in West Virginia. I looked at schools at, I, like I said, I looked at Penn State. I looked at Pitt. And um, my dad just loved going to look at colleges and, and he never went to college. So he always was so excited about going to look at colleges. And the one that I really liked was a Penn State campus, but it after two years at that campus, you needed to go to main campus to finish up nursing school. And I thought, I'm not going to do that. I am not going to go somewhere for two years, then pack up, and then have to go for another two years and fi finish up. So I get this brochure in the mail from Ball State. And I pick it up, and I read it, and I looked at my dad, and I said, this is where I'm going to go. And he said, really? And I said, yeah, this is where I'm going to go. And he said, no one else from around here is going to Ball State. No one else has even talked about going to Indiana for school. And I said, nope, I think this is where I'm going to go. And so that's where I came. The first time I saw Ball State was in orientation. Oh, wow. And I had already looked at about seven, eight, nine college campuses and did all the visits and all that kind of stuff and did never, did never come to Ball State. So when my kids were asking, how should we determine how we go to college, I said, well, I'm probably not one to tell you because I went sight unseen and went to Ball State. You mentioned the brochure being your deciding factor. Uh -huh. What exactly was it about what was on that brochure that influenced your decision? Actually, it was, I, I would tell you, one, I knew they had nursing. Um, 
two. It was the four-year program, mm -hmm. and, and interestingly enough at the time, if you got into school, you pretty much were guaranteed to be in the nursing program. Um, unless you did something really stupid or off the wall, you were pretty much guaranteed. So I, I thought, well, I won't have to worry about getting into school and doing well and then having to go ahead and reapply for nursing because I didn't really want to have to do that either. So ease of getting into nursing school, the pictures were pictures of the campus and the, um, in the dorms, and those were nice. But really, I don't know why, but I got it, and the pictures hit me, and the fact that the nursing school seemed to be easy to get into was a factor for me. And the other thing that happened at the time was Ball State's out-of-tuition, out-of-state tuition was actually cheaper than Pennsylvania's in-state tuition. Oh, wow. So that kind of added to the attraction of coming to Ball State. That's awesome. And then with orientation, what were you thinking when you first stepped on, foot on campus? Um, actually, it, it didn't surprise me. Mm -hmm. It was very, well, and once I got accepted, mm -hmm. of course you get all kind, we got all kind of information at the house about all the different things that, you know, all the different programs and everything that Ball State had. So I had all kinds of brochures, I had all kinds of pamphlets, I had all kinds of information about Ball State with pictures in it. So it wasn't a surprise. Um, I was quite happy to be here. During orientation, um, they, put the, they put us up in one of the dorms, and my parents were like, okay. Um, they were, um, but we, I mean, we came onto campus, and it was very much like we thought it was going to look, and there were no surprises, and it was a good feel, because you always have to worry about that. You know, you think you you know what you're doing and you walk onto campus and it could be awful and you could go, oh no, this isn't, this wasn't a good choice. But no, it felt right and it really did. That's wonderful. And then how did you hear about the Honors College and get involved in that process? After I got accepted at Ball State, then I got the information about the Honors College and about the Honors Program. And um, so it said I qualified and I could be in the honors program. And I said, all right. And it, it didn't say much about what the requirements were or what you needed to do. But I thought, well, you know, I'm accepted into the honors program as well, and I might as well take advantage of that while I'm here. You mentioned that you had heard about it right after you had gotten accepted. Did you ex have to accept to get into the honors college before you came to Ball State's campus, or was that something you took care of after you had already gone through orientation? I think I, if I remember correctly, I think I did it before. I think that um, I got accepted and, and then I got the information about the honors program and then went ahead and filled out that information and sent that in. So I think I was already a member of the honors program before I came to orientation, if I remember correctly. Okay. I'm interested in your transition from Pennsylvania to Indiana. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like for you when you came to Indiana and stepped on Ball State's campus? Okay, so remember, I went to high school and I graduated with 82 other students, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I lived in a suburb of Pittsburgh, um, very nice neighborhoods, um, very uncultured or not culturally diverse. Um, pretty much upper middle class white families with, like I said, Catholic and lots of, lots of children in the families. And that's what I was used to. So I came to Ball State with 18,000 students and not knowing anyone and also very culturally diverse at that time. So not that it bothered me in any way, shape or form, but it was very different than what I was used to in growing up and my education experiences in high school. Okay. And with that change in culture, do you feel like it was a little bit more of a culture shock for you when you first got to campus? What was your reaction to that? See, I don't think it was a, a culture shock for the culturally diverse population. I think it was a culture shock because it was big. I can relate to that. <laughs> Can you? In my college, or my high school had very few people in it mm -hmm. as well. And 
How was your collegiate experience different from your high school experience with that difference in population? Ooh, that's a hard question. Um, well, the collegiate experience is different anyway, mm -hmm. right? Because you're in, you're, you're in the dorm room, and I was in the dorms all four years. I never moved off campus, so I was in the dorms all four years at Ball State. So you're in the dorm room, you need to make I think the biggest thing for me was that you came, you set up your schedule, you had two or three hours of classes during the day, and then you were done. And so you had to figure out, and it took me, it took me a little bit of time to figure out when I was supposed to study, because I thought, well, heck, you know, I'm done with class, and it's two o'clock in the afternoon, because I'm a morning person, so I like to take classes at eight, nine, 10, and 11, and we were on the quarter system, so the classes were only 50 minutes. And so, you know, and you had them pretty much every day. So if my schedule was eight, nine, 10, and 11, I was done at lunchtime. So I had to figure out when I was gonna study and setting my, my priorities. And I wasn't sure I wasn't really sure how to do that because in high school, you go home. I mean, I played sports in high school, so I had different things to do after, after school. But when you go home, you knew that that's when you were supposed to finish up your homework or finish up what you hadn't completed during the day. Well, when you come here, you're in a dorm. No one's telling you what you're supposed to do. You finish up at lunchtime from your classes, and you go, whoa, when am I going to, you know, this is kind of nice. And for a while, it took me a while. It, it really took me a little bit of time to figure out how you set your schedule and when you work on your homework and when you actually can have free time. And, and so <coughs> that, was, um, that was a transition. I can imagine. You had mentioned that you lived in the dorms for all four years, mm -hmm. and during that time, Botswana and Swinford were mm -hmm. the dorms that were occupied by Honors College students. Right. Which one were you living in? I was actually in um, Botsford my last two years. I was in Wilson. Wilson. The first two years. Okay. Is Wilson still there? Probably not. They're in the process of demolishing. LaFalle. I know. I saw all of that when yeah. I drove by. Yeah, it's a sad one, but I'm pretty sure they're in the process of building a new dorm in place of it. Mm-hmm. So with that, what was your dorm experience like while you were living in the dorms? Okay, so we didn't have co-ed dorms. Um, so, you know, Swinford was the guys and Botsford was the girls and Wilson was split. So guys were on the first four floors and girls were on the upper four floors. So, I mean, it was pretty much, I don't know, um, I really enjoyed it. Um, I got to meet a lot of people. Um, pretty much, and I still talk to many of them today, and um, I don't know, it's hard, that's, that's a difficult question. I had a, I had a really, um, I had a really good time. I had, I had people that helped me make sure that I was on track for, um, for studying and things like that, and you had study groups, and, and everybody would go into the study area, and we would all know that we had to do homework, so that helped. Interestingly enough, there weren't a whole lot of nursing students that were in the, must not have been too many nursing students in the honors program because there were very few nursing students that were in, the, in the, that dorm. So um, a lot of them were walking to classes a lot closer than I was because I was trekking across campus to go to Cooper Science. And then um, when I had all my rotations at the hospital, that was, um, I was up bright and early, but there really weren't that many people in the dorm that were, must not have been in nursing classes. Okay, and then do you think that there's any reason for the lack of nursing students in the honors program? Is there any connection that you saw to that through your experience? I think a little bit that, ner that the honors program was more, um, I don't know, kind of more liberal arts based not as much science-based, so the classes were, really didn't apply to nursing. So if you were trying to get all your courses in and you were trying to be ready for nursing the last two years, then the honors classes were 
additional classes that I took, but really didn't do anything to help me get into, you know, to work towards the nursing degree. And since the honors courses are more humanities based, did mm -hmm. you find that to conflict a lot with your science and health um, sciences curriculum? Or your I don't think it conflicted. I think it was just different. Okay. Um, I just knew that when I was going to go to um, an honors course, it was going to be more writing papers, more group work, a um, lot of conversations, um, kind of... Uh, uh, not really tests, but more papers. And then when I went to nursing classes, it was tests, quizzes, tests, and you know, in in science, it's more in the whole nursing part of it. It's more you know, two plus two equals four. Um, in the humanities part and the honors part, it was sort of well, what do you think? And there, there's really no right or wrong answer. So it wasn't it wasn't conflicting, but it was just very different depending on what class I was going to. Okay. And then, um, not only were you a member of the Honors College, but you were also a member of the Nursing Honor Society. I was. Sigma Theta Tau. Mm -hmm. How did that impact you during your time at Ball State? Um, really didn't. I think it was just, um, it was nice to get into it. Um, there were a group of nurses. We had some meetings. We had some organizational um, functions, but it was just, it was, it was just a group that, you know, you, you knew that you were, you excel a little bit more in nursing and then you were able to join the Honor Society for Nursing. And what years were you involved in your nursing honors program? The last two years. Last two years? When I was a nurse. I was in the actual nursing program. Okay, and then did that provide you with any additional opportunities within the nursing program? Not that I remember. Were there any professors in the nursing program or honors faculty that have been an influential part of your experience? So there were t two in the honors program. Dr. Vanderhill was um, the first, one of my first professors, and he was the one that was in the basic humanities course that we had to start out with. And so, of course, first time in college, first time that I go to a class that has 100 people or 150 people in the room and um, he was the professor and um, also first time that it was more humanities based and more kind of esoteric for me and so he really made an impact on on me and then there was another physician that another physician another um, teacher professor that I really really liked was his name was Dr. Kasparic and he also taught two honors classes that I was in, and I really enjoyed his teaching. In nursing, um, one of the professors that I really admired, and I think it was because she did pediatrics, was um, Dr. Arndt. Her name was Mary Jo Arndt, and she was um, a very um, patient, soft-spoken professor that really helped on the pediatric side and I knew I wanted to go into pediatrics, so I think I probably paid more attention to her when she was teaching, too. When going through your information, I had noticed that you are very involved in the pediatric side mm -hmm. of hospitals and I of am. medicine. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Dr. Arndt had an influence on that, or was that something you were interested in beforehand? I was interested beforehand, but I think she probably did, because, um, you know, a rotation in nursing school can make or break you. If you have a really difficult rotation, um, you can say, I'm never doing this again. And you have options. In, in nursing, you have all kind of things that you can do. You can go into school nursing, you can go into hospital nursing, you can do ICU, you can do PEDS, you can do med surge, you can do anything. And so if you had a bad rotation and you struggled in that class, I would tell you that probably nine times out of 10, you go, eh, there's no way I'm gonna do this. But because she made the pediatric rotation so I guess not really pleasurable, but um, she was so patient and she really helped you learn that I think that um, I really even got more interested in the pediatric world because of that. And your youngest sister has spina bifida. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that also influenced your decision to think into pediatrics? 
Nope. Nope. I think I just always wanted to um, take care of kids. That's awesome. And with your honors curriculum, were you still taking honors courses while you were going through those rotations? I finished taking honors courses, I, if I remember correctly, I finished taking honors courses right after I started clinical rotations in nursing because I needed to, because the clinical rotations in nursing can really, it can, it can, it can be a little bit tough. <laughs> And so I think I tried really hard to complete those courses that were required for me before I was actually into the clinicals. And can you recall which year you had started taking your clinicals and you're doing your Took rotations? them the um, third year I was in school. So the first two years were all general courses and um, some of the science courses and getting through all of that. And then you started your clinical rotations your last two years. And they went... They went, for example, September through May of your junior year. Then we also had a summer in between, and then you took the whole next year of your senior year. Okay. And then you had mentioned previously that you were involved in sports in high school. Mm -hmm. Which sports were you involved in? I did volleyball and basketball. And you were involved in intramural volleyball throughout your I was. collegiate experience. Mm -hmm. How did that impact your time schedule and your time here at Ball State in general? That was a whole other group of friends. Um, that wasn't there, there wasn't anyone from nursing in there. There probably wasn't anyone in intramural sports that was from my dorm. And so it was a whole other group of friends. And you knew that you didn't do a whole lot of practicing because everybody else was just as busy as you were. But the games were fun and actually to me, those were a really good relief, you know, kind of a stress relief, something completely out of the nursing scope, completely out of the honors college, completely out of classroom work and um, homework. And it was just nice to, to do that and um, kind of get your mind off some of the things that you had to keep doing. Sounds like it was a really good experience. It was for fun. You. It was a lot of fun. What years did you participate in the intramural volleyball uh, team? The first, the first three years, all three years that I was here as a freshman, sophomore, and junior. Senior year, I did not, because senior year was pretty intense in in nursing. The other thing that happened, in, well, in nursing in senior year, you're doing rotations, you're doing like psych rotations, psychiatry rotations, and home health rotations. And they weren't done here in Muncie. They were done, my psych rotation was done in Marion, Indiana, and my home health was done, and I can't remember where, that's how bad that is. I can't remember where I did it, but you had to get in, in the car and you had to drive an hour to get to the rotation. So that really used up your whole day. So you were commuting from your dorm room here on campus mm -hmm. all the way to Marion. Was, was that a struggle for you or something that was Actually, that was, that was you, you had to incorporate that into your day, knowing that you were going to add, you know, three hours to your day by the time you got in the car. And then you, there was a group of us that, that met at Cooper Science, and someone always drove. The issue with that was that you had to leave about 6 o'clock in the morning or 5.30 in the morning because you needed to be at the rotation by, you know, 7 or 7.30. And so um, we were always happy that someone else drove. And um, a lot of times we just all fell asleep because it was just easier to do that. So I was really glad that someone would drive on those rotations. But, um, but you just put that into your day and you just knew that you had to be here at, at Cooper Science when it was time to get in the car and go. I could see that. <laughs> And for a lot of intramural teams, just going back to that, I know there's usually a huge time commitment depending on the sport. Right. Was there a huge time commitment with intramural volleyball for you? Or no, not not quite as much as um, some some of them. I mean, like I said, there were some practices and there were the games, but not a super huge time commitment. But you're right, there are some intramural sports that you could, I mean, you could eat away at your time. but volleyball didn't for me because if it did I would have had to probably stop um, there are there are a lot of nights I was studying till two or three in the morning in preparation for clinicals the next day so if if it was going to take up more time than it already did then I probably couldn't have done it okay 
And with um, your clinicals kind of being something that came after your time with your honors college courses, mm -hmm. do you think that your honors college courses better prepared you in a way for your clinical courses? Or I think they did um, because um, when it comes time to, it probably didn't prepare me, how do I say this? It probably didn't prepare me for my clinical courses. It more prepared me for my graduate degree because in my graduate degree, then you had to write a, di a, you know, a thesis and you had to write papers and you had to do clinical overviews of, um, and so being in the honors program helped me with my writing and helped me express myself and communicate better. That's wonderful. And you won an award in the nursing program while you were there. Can you recall what reward or what award that was? Did I win an award in the nursing program or did I win it later for the? You won one while you were in the nursing program, while you were a member, and then you also won one after while you were an alum. <sighs> yes. And I can't remember what it was. How bad is that? Sorry. A long time ago. No, you were totally fine. Well, would you like to talk about the one that you won after as an alum? Yeah, that one was um, really special. Um, that's the Nursing Alumni Award and um, came back, I think it was four years ago or five years ago, and um, got that award. And it was nice because the, you know, it was the nursing program. It was the, you know, chairman of the, of the nursing program. It was a lot of people that, you know, and there were nursing students in the room. And it was just very nice to come back and see that actually Maybe I did make a difference in nursing in some way or another, and that um, the nursing students appreciated learning from um, people that had gone through the program and pretty much were successful on the other side, because I think I'm pretty successful now. And um, so that was, that was quite an honor to be able to come back and be recognized for that. With that, um, do you remember the name of the award and the year that you were given it? I knew you were going to ask me that. It was the it was the Nursing Alumni Award, um, and I I think it was I want to say like four or five years ago maybe, but I don't remember the exact year. Okay. But came back here. There was a um, banquet and you know a dinner, and it was just a very nice event. It's lovely. As a woman in science, do you feel as though you faced any challenges while you were going through your undergraduate degree? or No, because I did nursing. You know, if I, if I was in medical school or if I was in, this is going to sound really bad, but, you know, nursing is kind of a female-oriented world. In fact, there were, I think, four, four men in our nursing program. There were 80 graduates, so four men in there, so everybody was female. So, you know, you just sort of, that was just the way it was. Um, so because I was in nursing, it was easier for me as a female. In administration, it's a little bit different. It is a little bit different. But as a nurse, kind of the expectation is you're a female, you're a nurse, and that's how it is. Do you see that dynamic changing today with the male to female ratio? I do. I do. I see more males going into nursing um, than ever before, only because um, I think nursing is a really good profession. I mean, it, it pays well. It's definitely needed. Um, nurses are pretty much the patient's advocate from, you know, the first time they do anything in patient care. And I really think that um, the male, um, males entering into the nursing profession is a great thing because that perspective is um, what, you know, the patients need. And like I said, it's a, it's a great job and it's a really rewarding profession if that's what you're looking for. It definitely is. Yeah. You took on a lot of different extracurriculars and a lot of different programs with the Honors College, with volleyball, and with being in the nursing program. Mm -hmm. Was there ever a time when you felt like you had struggled or oh, yeah. you were thinking about <laughs> Oh yeah. Um, past? Yep. There were, um, and I don't remember what paper it was, but I had a paper due for the honors program and I could not make myself do it. I could not, I just could not do it. And um, we haven't talked about my husband yet, but he was, I met him here and he was a member of the honors program. And if it was not for him telling me that we need to sit down and we need to get those papers done, I'm not sure I would have ever done it. 
because no matter how many times, you know, it's one of those where you wake up in the middle of the night and you go, I know I have to do this, and it's on, I know I have to do it, but I just can't, I could not bring myself to write that paper. And there just were so many other priorities, and for some reason I don't think it, it really interested me, and it was kind of like, I'll just keep, I'll wait until I absolutely have to do it. Like I said, I finally got forced to do it because if I, I'm, I think I probably would have just said, you know what, it's an honors class, good, that's great, but maybe, it, maybe it's just not worth it. So I really struggled with that one paper. Classroom-wise, no. Classes overall, no. But I could not make myself do that. Did you see other students struggle in that way as well, trying to balance their coursework for honors with their... Um, yeah, some. Um, I don't consider myself very... There are people that you know that are very smart, and they can, they can be in the honors program, and they can do 90 things, and they just sail through it. I have a daughter that's just like that. Anything she does you know, honors-wise, in college, everything. Everything was just super easy for her. And she could set priorities and she could do it. I'm not that type of person. So, but there were people in the honors program that could easily sail through it. But then there were other people that were just like me that, you know, were doing a good job and were pretty good at their grades and did pretty well in school, but weren't that, that level of intelligence that you could sail through it. So I think there was probably some struggle, not just me, but other people in the program. And how did you cope with that as you were going through that struggle? Was there anything you did internally for yourself? Um, well, see, I don't quit. So to me, it's, you know, I struggled with getting things done, but I knew they had to get done. And I was in that program, so I was gonna finish that program. So to me, it was just, something I had to do. Okay. I can relate. <laughs> and you met your husband at Ball State and he was in the Honors College as he well. Was. And you married on August 9th of 1980. We did. How exactly did you two meet? In actually an honors class. Um, it was Dr. It, it was Dr. Kasparik's class and it was a class where you we watched a movie and then you had to interpret, you know, watch movies, which was fun and then you had to write papers about what the social meaning of the movie was, and um, which, of course, I didn't do very well at. He did much better at. However, he was a math major and a PE major, so he was also kind of black and white and into the, so we both kind of struggled with writing papers like that, but it was in that class, and plus he was in um, Swinford, so he was in that dorm. What year did you take that class? That was the class. first year that we were here. So it was, um, you know, 1975. And with you both having that black and white mindset, did you two work together to we did. make your way through that? Yeah, we did. We worked a lot together. Um, he helped me on the nursing side mm -hmm. with drug cards and, you know, memorizing drugs. And then I helped him and he helped me write the papers and um, get through the honors classes. Were you two together all four years of college? We did not date um, all four years of college, but we did date very seriously the last two years of college. And that's sweet. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> I do like that. And you two have two children together, we do. correct? We do. Can you tell me a little bit about your children? Yep. Um, I have an older daughter. Oh, my oldest daughter is almost 30, and she... They were both born in Houston, um, and she's 30. She went to school. Um, they both have graduate degrees. They both went to school in um, Bel, Air, Bel Air High School in Houston and moved on. Um, she went to Texas Tech and got a degree in civil engineering and then went on to University of Central Florida and got a, job, and got a degree with an MBA and um, athletic administration. Go figure. So then she um, went into engineering and she designs athletic facilities. She's awesome. And she's in Charlotte, North Carolina right now. And that's where she is and absolutely loves it. My second daughter is 
um, very different. Um, oh, she's, she's kind of the one that if you wanted someone who is, uh, my oldest daughter is the one who, if you wanted someone very smart, very pretty, very elegant, that's her. If you want to go to a party, you want to go with my, my youngest daughter. She is 26, and she graduated from Bella High School, and then she went to Trinity University in San Antonio, and she got a degree in education, and she has a master's as well in education, and she is teaching pre-K in Houston right now, and she just got married six months ago. So she's, yeah, so she is, she's, you know, she'll tell stories, and she's the one that makes you laugh, and and she's, she has always said this. Um, my youngest daughter said there's always, you know, people are put on this earth for a reason. My oldest daughter was put on the earth so that she can tell us how it's going to be and how we should live our life. And she's put on this earth to make us laugh. And, and that's exactly how the two of them are. Very different. Yin and yang. Okay. Very much. Very much. You mentioned that your eldest daughter is involved in administration. Do you think that your involvement in administration kind of influenced nope. that decision? Nope, nope. In fact, she did. She, I think because my husband's an athletic director, she really liked the aspects of athletics and athletics administration. So I think he influenced her more for the um, MBA in the athletic um, in the sports administration program. So he influenced her more on that. Um, I probably influenced my younger daughter on education. I, when I got my graduate degree, I got it in nursing education because I was going to teach. Um, obviously, I didn't do that, but um, so I think I influenced her more on that side. What changed your mind on the teaching position? Just because um, of the opportunities that came to me. I, you know, I was, I was a nurse, and then I was the charge nurse. Then I was the nurse supervisor, and then I was the nursing director, and I and then um, a job opened up at Shriners as a director of patient care services, and so as director of patient care services, um, I was over all the operations. I was pretty much second in command at the hospital, and then um, so the opportunity came to be an administrator, and I just kind of took that path. Um, would I want to go back and do education? I'm not sure, um, but that, that's what my graduate degree is in, but I, I just never used it. I mean, I used the graduate degree information, but I didn't use the education part of it. Okay. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Mm -hmm. May I ask your husband and your daughter's names just for record? Uh -huh. um, my oldest daughter's name is Alyssa, and my youngest daughter's name is Andrea, and my husband's name is Steve. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You moved to Houston following your graduate graduation from Ball State where you took a job at the Texas Medical Center. I did. What influenced this decision? Um, that's pretty simple. Um, I got married and my husband got a job at Rice University. And when w people found out, I was working in Pittsburgh at the time, and so when people found out that we were moving to Houston, they said, well, you know, the world's largest medical center is in Houston, Texas, and so you can pretty much probably find a job anywhere. Rice University is across the street from the Texas Medical Center. So Rice University is here, Main Street goes this way, and then there's the Texas Medical Center that has 75 institutions in the Texas Medical Center. And when I moved there, there are 110,000 people that work in the Texas Medical Center every day. So I had my choice of about eight different hospitals. I could have gone, you know, if you moved to Houston, when I moved to Houston, you should work in the Texas Medical Center as a nurse. But um, it helped that Rice University was right across the street, so we were able to go ahead and get a place that was pretty close to both of our jobs. That is awesome. And you mentioned that during your master's time, you felt like your Ball State honors experience had influenced and made that a little bit easier. Definitely. Can you elaborate on that a little yep. bit for me? Um, when you the graduate degree was, there were some clinicals that you need to do, needed to do. Um, so that was easy for me because I was working. So I could just go to the hospital where I was working and, and do some of those clinicals there. So that was, that was helpful. But um, a lot of it was um, writing papers and taking information and 
you know, synth synthesizing it into um, kind of coming up with plans of how you take care of patients or what you do um, on the clinical side. So my part, the honors program at Ball State helped me learn how to communicate in writing and helped me learn how to communicate in groups and kind of take group leads and, and be part of a team. And so there's a lot of that that goes on in graduate school, so that helped me a lot there. Awesome. And what years did you go to Texas Women's University for your master's? Okay, so what does it say on there? Do you know? <laughs> I can't... Um, you graduated in 1988. Yeah, so I went to school. I probably, it, I went part-time because I was working full-time. So I, I was probably 1983 through 88. It took me about five years by the time I went part-time and just took one class a semester. And, um, and then by the time I got my, um, my thesis done. So it was probably a period of four to five years that it took me that long. What prompted you to pursue a master's degree? Um, I just think I wanted to go back to school. I had, um, you know, graduated in 79. I worked for, you know, a year in Pennsylvania. Then I went to, we went to Houston, and I was pretty, pretty um, okay in my job. And Texas Women's University was part of the Texas Medical Center. It was easy enough. Oh, and the other thing is, at, at work, tuition reimbursement, um, they paid for you to go back to school. And in Texas at the time, it was $7 a credit hour. So it was nothing to go back to school. And so um, some of it was that, but some of it was that I just thought I was ready to go. You know, I was ready for something else. And so I went on ahead and got my master's. Okay. And you were taking night classes towards this, correct? I was. Did it feel a lot like your experience at Ball State with those early mornings and it did. late nights? It did. And it, it felt a lot like, um, and, and I did not do, we didn't have online learning. So those, it was classroom learning. So you had to leave work, go to class, come home, do homework. No different than it was at Ball State. You know, you... you you knew when you were going to class, you knew what your homework was, and you knew when you needed to, you know, get it done. That's awesome. And then as you look back on your collegiate years at Ball State, what stood out to you and what really was something that meant a lot to you as you were going through those years? I think probably the friendships and the people and how pretty much, even though there were 18,000 students, you found, I found, a niche of friends that were very, very good friends and still are good friends today. And I think that helps a lot because, the, you know, you can, you can go to school and do your classes and, um, you know, you can go to school, you can do your classes, you can do your homework, you can get through it, you can graduate, and, and everybody can do that. But I think the other part of college is the whole college experience of meeting people, doing different things besides just going to class, and really kind of helping you grow in more ways than, than just the education and the intelligence part. That's awesome. You mentioned that a lot of these people that you had met in college are people that you are still in contact with mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Are those within your honors college friend group or which friend group really? Actually, um, both. Um, some were just from the dorms. Mm -hmm. um, some are from honors programs, or the honors program, and some are from nursing. That is awesome. And are they living all over the country? All over the country. There are some here in Indiana. Um, some in Ohio, some in Pennsylvania, um, one of them's in Florida, and uh, a couple are in California. And how did you manage to keep those relations tight and strong as you were going through your experience within the nursing program? Um, we just, we, we used each other to, you know, to kind of keep us grounded. If, if one person was just really crazy and, 
was so overwhelmed with all the stuff they had to do, there usually was another friend that wasn't. And so you kind of helped each other to calm each other down and help each other get through some of the tough times. Do you think having a support system like that helped you get through? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I don't think you can do it. Um, it, it. It's always interesting to me now to look at online learning because if you, if you, to me, I don't know how you have that support system if you're learning on the computer and you're learning online. Some of that, you know, coming back to the dorm, I mean, I think that's why I stayed in the dorm for four years because almost that whole circle of friends stayed in the dorm for four years. So it was so, you know, it was so easy for us. It was just we, after a summer, you'd pick up right back up where you were before. And we always supported each other through all kinds of things. That's awesome. With that relation and with you staying in the dorms for so long, do you think that that improved your grades or made it a little bit easier to I do. excel? I do. I think if you didn't have to worry about cooking a meal or going somewhere for a meal or um, worried about different things that you have to do when you're renting property and when you have to worry about having a car and you know driving from where you are and taking the additional time to, to get to class, I think that it made it easier and it made, made it easier for me definitely to concentrate on what I needed to do for school. It's definitely understandable. You had mentioned that you worked in Pennsylvania for a year after graduating. I did. Can you elaborate on that a little I bit? I worked for at me? Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh for um, a year, and I did pediatrics, and so that was my first job. Um, when I got out of Ball State, I interviewed. Actually, before I graduated from Ball State, I started interviewing um, at spring break. I remember going into downtown Pittsburgh, and I interviewed at four different hospitals. I got offered jobs at all four hospitals, which was great. And um, the one I took was in at Allegheny General for pediatrics. Was there a reason for that choice? Yep, that's the one that felt right to me. Never go against your gut. Nope, nope. You know, when, um, and I tell people that all the time, you know, when I interview people for jobs or when you're interviewing for jobs, there's something to be said that, you know, there's a feeling and you know that it's the right thing to do. And that was the right place for me to be. That's awesome. Do you think that you follow that gut feeling with a lot of what you do oh, did yeah. growing up and going through school? Oh yeah. Yep. And um, you had mentioned that your your family was very involved in the Catholic Church, and mm -hmm. church was something that was a steeple of your upbringing. Mm -hmm. Was that something that you pursued while you were in college as well? I did. I was um, went to the Newman Center and um, went to church here. The same, you know. Now, could I tell you that I went every Sunday or every Saturday? No, but um, it was still very much a part of my, my four years here at Ball State. Did you start going to church at the Newman Center as soon as you came to Ball State? I did. What was your experience like there? That was very much the same as it was in the church in, in my neighborhood. Um, lots of groups. You could get involved with as much as you wanted to or as little as you wanted to, and you still kind of felt like you were part of the, part of the, um, part of the group. Did you get involved outside of just going to church on Sundays when you could go? Uh, I think I did some, um, I think if I remember correctly, I did some service things. Um, like on a day, on a Saturday, we would go, you know, do something in a ser for a service project. But that's about as much as I, I could do. Okay. Also remember I had met my husband. And so now during that time, you know, there were a lot of things that we wanted to do together too. So. What did you two do together? Oh, we didn't, well, we didn't do a whole lot off campus, but we did a whole lot on campus. We went to, took advantage of some concerts and took advantage of some plays and um, part of the theater stuff that's here. Um, movies, if they had um, movies, did a lot of studying together too because we were both pretty, pretty busy that way. The Bracken Library was built in 1975, which mm -hmm. was the year that you came to mm -hmm. Ball State. I lived at the Bracken Library. Um, there was, we used to have to do care plans for um, our clinicals, and there is a place on one floor at the back of the Bracken Library where I just sat at that table for hours and, and did the care plans and read up on the books and everything else. Um, I, I was there a lot. <laughs> did you feel like the facility helped you and benefited your learning? At the oh time? yeah, because it was quiet. I found a quiet place. Um, it had the materials that I needed and I was able to utilize um, 
you know, I was able to utilize the resources there to, I think, probably do a better job at, at you know, my homework and what I needed to get done. And of all of the people that went there, did you have any study groups that came to the library or did you work on that yourself? I did. I, I was pretty, I, I went there so that I could concentrate and be by myself. Very rarely did I meet anybody at the library. Okay. And you mentioned that it was also very quiet there. So were a lot of people at the library and just very quiet or was it something that not a lot of people utilized at the time? That's an interesting question. I think that... Um, I think that probably a lot of people did utilize it. I think they went to get what they needed and then went back to wherever they lived and did their, I, I used it more to actually study there. But I don't think, if I remember correctly, I, I just don't think a lot of people probably used it for long periods of time. Okay. And there is a library in the basement of the Cooper Science Complex. Was that in place during your time at Ball State? If it was, I didn't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And what was your experience like overall in the nursing program? How did you feel that it compared to other programs when you got into your later on, like within your master's, other people that were in nursing programs? If I worded that correctly. Ask that question again. Like, okay, so. Um, Ball State's nursing program, mm -hmm. how do you think it compared to those of the people that you knew within the medical field that went to other nursing programs at other schools? So personally, I thought our program was really hard. Um, and I think that when I talked to other people that were in nursing programs, they did not do as much or was that I don't think that they worked as hard as I did, but you know, that could just be my own perception. But I thought our, our program was pretty difficult and pretty intense. Um, there wasn't probably a semester that went by that one or two of people, in, two of the students in the program were told, had the conversation about, are you sure you really wanna be a nurse because you're not doing very well in this program? And so it was, it was pretty intense. And so when I talked to other people and what their nursing school experience was, I really think ours was probably harder. Do you think your tenacious personality helped you get through that and persevere through all of the hardships that you I just think I liked it, so I did okay. I mean, I don't think, like I said, I'm not stellar. I don't think I was, you know, I wasn't in any shape or form at the top of the class. But I think I liked doing what I was doing and it really interested me. So, you know, I was, I, I concentrated on it and I liked doing it. That's awesome. You mentioned that you and your husband, now husband, at the time that you were at Ball State, attended a lot of plays and theaters mm -hmm. on campus. Can mm -hmm. you elaborate on that a little bit for me? Oh, so um, a lot of the things that the, it was at Emmons Auditorium, it was, um, you know, like they brought in um, Red Skelton one time and The Letterman and just different, just different um, musical groups. And then there were some plays and some theater, theater things that um, we went to. Nothing that was really special, just something it was kind of like, well, this is going on, why don't we go see it? You know, really n nothing that we took the time to select and say, oh yes, we have to do this. But it was more of, you know, it's available and we should take advantage of it. I understand that. Ball State at the time, and still to this day, is often referred to as an island community, as in we typically kind of mingle around each other rather than getting out into the local community. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that was something that was kind of in oh, place yeah. when you were Oh yeah, it was, it was um, we stayed on campus. We didn't, we didn't go very, very often outside of campus. Um, I would say that that's probably very true or it was true when I was here. Did a lot of other students do that as well? Was it a community-wide? Yeah, I think that, um, but, but the other thing that happened in when I was here is that if you lived about an hour or two hours from here, almost every weekend, people would go home, which I thought was kind of strange. And because I lived in Pennsylvania, I didn't go home very often, but um, it just seemed like everybody if you, if you lived an hour or so from here, on Fridays, people would pack up and they would go home. And so 
the weekend was really, you know, really quiet on the campus. Did in fact, know? they didn't even serve food in the dorms on Friday night oh. because so many people went home on Fridays that there was no reason to open up the, the cafeteria. Did you notice that most of the halls then were empty when you were Pretty much. on the weekends? But then that helped me because then I was able to do a lot of my homework because it was quiet. Were a lot of your friends locals from around the yep. community as well? Yeah. Okay. How did that impact the weekend life? Was there a lot going on other than just people that were on campus that lived too far away from home or was there any social aspect to not really being on campus not really it was kind of monday through friday and then it was different on on saturday and sunday okay now my husband when he was here he was on the basketball team so he was pretty much always here because they had practices or games or 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 he might be traveling with the team but he was pretty much um so he was always here he was on the actual Ball State basketball team? He was. What was that experience like? I mean, it was fun to go. I mean, he, he played for um, his first year, and then he was more manager the last couple years he was here. But um, So it was fun to go watch. But it was also fun because even if he wasn't playing, I still felt like it, you know I was more a part of the team. And you played basketball in high school, correct? I did. Did you think that that was something that you could relate to him on? Wow. I hate basketball. I hate <laughs> basketball. I really do. I mean, it's March Madness right now, and the TV's on all the time, and, and I get it, but I really don't like to watch basketball. I probably didn't like it when I was playing either. So you were much Seriously. more related I mean, to volleyball. I was. Understandable. And both my girls play volleyball. And with him being involved on a sports team through mm -hmm. Ball State, do you think that that made his honors college experience a little bit harder? It him? did. It did because he had exactly the same problem I did is that he was um, he was taking these math courses that were just horribly intense. And so he had exactly the same issue. He had to figure out when he was, you know, traveling with the team or when he was at practice. I mean, when you had to put in three hours of practice every night after school, you know, after your classes were over, he had to figure out when he was going to be able to do his work as well. So he had exactly the same problem I did. If you got involved in too many things or you had too much stuff going on, you still had to set your priorities and figure out how you were going to get them done. Okay. And then... You're currently an administrator at Shriners Hospital for Children, which you've been at since March of 2014. Mm -hmm. What exactly led you to that decision to go into administration? So, it kind of, the decision was kind of made for me. Um, I was at, I was the director of patient care and um, at Shriners, and so I was responsible, I was kind of number two in the hospital. So I was responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of what happened at the hospital. There, I had an administrator and he was, um, and so some, some things happened and some changes were made and he, we started looking at should we have an administrator for, we have a Galveston hospital that's 50 miles away. And so we talked about should we have an administrator over both hospitals. Um, Houston and Galveston and so we started interviewing for that and he was not he did not want to do both hospitals so he left the um, administrator in Galveston also left at the same time and so we were oh, we were looking for administrators so we got someone in place who was over Houston and Galveston which was great and then they asked him to take over the Tampa hospital in Tampa Florida so he had Houston, Galveston, and Tampa. So he was probably in the Houston hospital maybe three days a month, if that. And so they kind of changed, when, when we started making all those changes, we changed the role, the, um, the role of my job as director of patient care became sort of um, director of operations. So it was kind of a higher level and I was starting to do a lot of administrative duties. So then that administrator who was over Houston, Galveston, and Tampa left, and we started interviewing people. 
And there was a director of operations in Galveston as well, who was also a nurse, and I was a nurse. And so we started interviewing people, and we quickly realized that there wasn't anybody that was doing, that we, that we want, I mean, we looked at so many people, and we said, you know what, this is, this is not right. We're doing it anyway, and why don't you just go ahead and take Galveston, and I'll take Houston. And we put that proposal forward, and they said, okay, you have it. So then I became an administrator. That's wonderful. Congratulations. Oh, thanks. And how did you end up at Shriner to begin with? I was at um, Herman Hospital, which was in the Texas Medical Center when I moved to Houston. I was there for 18 years and absolutely loved that hospital. But Shriners had the director of patient care services position, which would have been a promotion for me. And it would have led me into more the operation side of of patient care, not just the nursing side. So I would have been responsible for what was going on with the facilities and what was going on in um, dietary and what was going on in the therapy services. So it gave me a broader knowledge of patient care. And so um, they offered me that job. So it was a promotion for me. And so I, I actually sought it out because it would have been um, what I was doing at um, Herman at the time, at Memorial Herman at the time, was a director of nursing, but I had been doing that. I did it in pediatrics, I did it in med surge, I did it in different areas. And so I was kind of, I had pretty much learned what I wanted to learn there. And so I looked for, I looked at this job and it was a promotion. And so I received that job and that's why I went to Shriners. That's awesome. Do you like administration better than the actual nursing side? Okay, so at Shriners, I have a really great option. I'm the administrator, but I'm also a nurse, and we do outreach clinics in different parts of the state of Texas. So I go to all the outreach clinics. So when I go to the outreach clinics, I'm a nurse. When I come back to Shriners, I'm the administrator. So for me, I have the best of both worlds. When I've had enough of all the paper pushing and everything that's on my desk, and I have just can't do it anymore, then I can always walk down to the inpatient unit, and I can take care of patients if I want to, or I can do patient care. Or I can go to outreach clinics, and I can do patient care. So the nurse in me is still there, and that's the most rewarding. But it is very nice being an administrator and being able to lead change and make changes as, as I can and get you know people um, that work for me on board and make some really good changes in the hospital. But really at the end of the day, it's what we can do for patients. And so I get a chance to go and take care of patients if I need to. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So with that, you have the best of both worlds. I you're do. able to be a nurse, you're able to be an administrator. Mm -hmm. Do you feel very fulfilled in your role as I do. both a nurse and I do. Um, I'm probably more fulfilled in my role as a nurse than I am an administrator because there's always the buck stops here mentality when you're the administrator. And so you get all the stuff that nobody else wants to handle and, and you worry about things. So I lose a lot of sleep at night worrying about things that are happening or things that I can't change or, or people that, you know, I'm worried about, um, or what has to happen or what, what projects or anything we're doing the next day. So to me, that's, um, that's a little tough. Nursing, you pretty much, when you go in, you take care of a child, you do a dressing change, you do a procedure, you watch them get better, and so that's very fulfilling. The administrator part, yes, it's fulfilling, but it's just, it's, it's a little, I worry about that part. That's not quite as rewarding for me sometimes. Understandable. With being involved in nursing, you have to have that selfless, passionate, caring aspect about your personality. Mm -hmm. When did you notice that you had that and that you really wanted to fulfill this career? I think I've known that a long time. I mean, I always wanted to be a nurse. For as, for as long as I can remember, I wanted to be a nurse. That's awesome. And I, I don't know, you know, I don't know how I came up you know, how I got it, or maybe because I'm the oldest of six kids and kind of always did the babysitting and kind of took care of everybody, but um, I just always wanted to be a nurse. That's awesome. 
So we're going to backtrack a little bit mm -hmm. back to your experience in the Honors College. Okay. So in 1976, the first Widinger scholarships were offered in the fall. Did you see an influx of honor students coming into Ball State at the time? Not that I remember. Not that I think because um, what happened was the way I think the program was set up, we pretty much had our class mm -hmm. that was in the honors program. So we were already started because I started in 75. So we were already started. So 76, yeah, you saw some different people come in, but I think they started at the beginning of the program where I was already into the second year of the program. Okay. Was there a lot of communication between different honors college level graduates or like people that were in like freshman, sophomore communication or sophomore, junior communication? I don't remember a whole lot. I think we were pretty much in our class and we all worked together in our class. Yes, you had some, some classes that had freshmen, sophomores, and juniors in them, but I mean, but that was the way it was throughout of, all of Ball State. I mean, you had, depending on what class you were taking, you might have all different levels of people. So I don't think it was any different in the honors program. Okay. What about outside of the classroom? Did you see a lot of communication between different grade levels? Not really. Okay. And then... Um, also from 1977 to 1975, there was an influx of presidents that came through Ball State. Mm -hmm. What was this experience like for you? Did this impact your honors college or your collegiate experience at all? Nope. 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 I have a brother who's a president of a university, and it's very interesting because as, you, um, as I talk to him, you think that the, and I think small universities the president, well, like, for example, my husband's at Houston Baptist University in athletics. The president, and there's, there's 3,500 students in this, in this school. So, and when my daughter went to Trinity, very small school as well, the president lives on campus. And so everybody knows the president, and they walk through campus, and everybody knows them. I think at a school this size, you don't know who the president is. So I'm not exactly sure that I would, I would, know if the president made a difference or not. I know that sounds awful, but truly, that's, uh, you know, I just didn't see the impact. Do you think that that was a positive or a negative aspect of? I don't think it really had, I don't think it was either. I mean, I think that, you know, you went to school, you knew what was in your world, right? And you knew what you were trying to accomplish. And I think that that's, and if the president made a difference in that or made a change, then you just adjusted to the change. Okay. And we had mentioned your affiliation with the Nursing Honor Society, mm -hmm. with the intramural volleyball team. Mm -hmm. Were there any other clubs or activities that you had participated in? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. And when you mentioned also that you're, you had gone from a school with less than 100 people in mm -hmm. high school, transitioned to a college of 18,000 people, mm -hmm and then onto a hospital with 100,000 plus employees, I believe? Well, the Texas Medical Center has that many, mm -hmm. right. Do you think that your experience at Ball State with it being 18,000 and a little bit larger benefited you as you moved on to a larger? Oh yes, I think that um, if I, I think you're pretty sheltered if you, um, if you stay in kind of a small group of people. And I think that coming to Ball State and learning about different types of people, different ages, different cultures, um, people with different interests, um, I think that helps a lot when you go out in the world and you have to determine, you know, what kind of job do you want to get and how, you know, and the people that you work with and things. And what was your experience like interacting with these people that were so much different from the Catholic upper middle class. See, and, and I, I didn't think that there was a whole lot of difference. I just kind of, you know, I, I just enjoyed meeting people that had different thoughts and different ideas and different perspectives. I mean, it was, I, I do have friends that came from small areas in Indiana and came to Ball State and had exactly the same um, issues I did of going from a small high school to, you know, a big college. But we all kind of just went with the flow, and I, I think it was just very interesting learning about different people and where they come from and kind of their backgrounds as well. I can relate to that. 
Um, can you tell me a little bit more about your time at Texas Medical Center after you got your master's? Mm -hmm. um, I worked in, um, so I, like I said, I, I was a nurse on an um, oncology unit, adult oncology unit, and then I moved into the charge nurse and then to the director of nursing role in that, that unit. Then I was over on the weekends, um, we would cover all the different units in the um, hospital. So I would cover probably seven or eight different units with, they'd be med surge units, they might be um, adult medicine, they might be onco the oncology unit, just, just different. And um, after about 10 years at, um, at that job, I went ahead and um, moved into pediatrics. So I, at that point, I was the nursing director over the pediatric intensive care unit and the pediatric transplant unit. So I got to see kids get kidney transplants and liver transplants and take care of, take care of those children. What was that experience like for you? That was um, quite fascinating. Um, we did some of the first living-related liver transplants for children. So that's where you take a part of the liver from an adult and you give it to the child. And so, um, and then it grows in the child, which I think is so cool. And then it also regenerates in the adult as well. And so um, just to see some of those children that were so sick and walk out of the hospital and do very well um, was, was very rewarding to me. Um, so that was, but that was a pretty intense time too because, you know, I'd be on call and the phone would ring at night or my pager would go off and I'd be responsible for staffing and there's always a nurse or there's always somebody that calls in sick and you can't cover, you know, and you need to staff. And so my job would be to go in and I'd have to do the staffing. And um, I was having children at the time and it became a little bit difficult to kind of work the personal life and the, and the work life. And my husband being in athletics usually had some kind of athletic event every night. So I really couldn't depend on him a lot. So um, that was a little bit, it was tough, but it was also very rewarding to, to be able to work in those units. And, and I got a lot of knowledge. I gained a lot of knowledge. And you come out of nursing school and you know some, but which, when, where you really learn is when you actually get the job and have to do it yourself. And there's not a professor telling you what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong. And it's kind of up to you to learn. My mom told me about the learning curve that comes out of nursing school. Yes. So I can really it is very well tough. understand. Well, the first time, you know, you, you do it and you have this patient population and you have these five patients or six patients that you're responsible for and you say, okay, here they are. And you go, all right, it's time for me to do this, but no one's looking over my shoulder to make sure I do it right. What was that experience like for you when you first came into nursing school or you were actually a nurse and an RN in a hospital in comparison to that experience in nursing school with you going through the clinicals and having that guidance? Well, I think one of the best things the nursing school did here was that we had what we called a management rotation at the very end. And you were responsible for, you'd go on to the med surge unit over at Ball Memorial, you were responsible for the 21 patients or whatever that were on that unit. So you had to know something about all of them, you had to understand what their medications were, and you had to be able to work with the nursing staff that was already there to be able to determine what care was needed and setting priorities for care. Um, and so that, was probably the only time where you didn't have someone that was truly looking over your shoulder and making sure that you did everything at the right minute and the right time. And so that was very helpful because when you get out and you get a job, your shift is whatever your shift is and you're responsible for figuring out how you get things done at the right time for the group of patients you have. Knowing that, Maybe a patient's going to come from the emergency room and get admitted and you're going to have to interrupt your day to get a new patient into the bed and things like that. And so that was one of the real benefits of, I think, that management rotation when you had to take care of multiple patients, set priorities, and you didn't have anyone telling you what you were supposed to do. Of course, you learned from that because you never did it right. And so you had to figure out what to, you know, how to, how to change that.
What was that experience like for you, learning how to manage multiple patients at a time while you were in nursing school and trying to learn everything else along? So that? I would tell you that I can't tell you the number of times I said, I'm not sure I can do this. You know, um, just because it was, there's certain givens. Um, patients have to have medications at certain times and you have to know what you're doing and you have to, and treatments have to be done at certain times. But, you know, a doctor that comes in and then completely changes the treatment plan and changes the medications or changes the time frame that you're looking at, you know, there's always, you were always at the mercy of somebody else. And so that was, there were a lot of times where it, it was, you had to learn how to, how to do it and you had to learn how to manage. And you also had to have all that knowledge because you couldn't make decisions about what you were supposed to do next unless you knew what was actually going on with the patient. And so that was, it, it, was a, it was a juggling act. And you had to really learn how to do, how to think, probably linear thinking more than anything, because you had to be looking at, you know, three different projects at the same time and getting to the end result. And you couldn't, you couldn't deviate from it. And so that was, um, that was a little complicated. And with nursing, nursing, nursing school, apologies, I know you have to develop your confidence as you go into where you feel very confident that you can tell a patient what you are going to do. Mm -hmm. How did you develop that confidence? That took a while. Um, because you really don't know. And um, it's each patient's different. And I will tell you, I probably really didn't develop that confidence until I did oncology my first um like my third or fourth year of oncology because we had to, when we were doing cancer treatments and, and um, working with our patients, you had to have some hard conversations with them. You know, and they, they depended on you to tell them the truth. And so if they would ask me questions like, you know, is this gonna make me better or, or am I dying or how come I'm so sick and can you help me? You know, you had to learn how to have those conversations, and that's probably when I really started having the, the, the confidence that I knew what I was doing and I was able to answer those questions because it's, it, it takes a while, and you really don't know, and you have to kind of, and, and there's a person in that bed that's depending on you, and if you can't do that for them, then you probably have no business being there. But yet, you really don't know what you're doing and you learn as you go. You mentioned before when you were talking about a lot of your honors college experience that you had trusted in your husband at the time and you two mm -hmm. went back and forth and would kind of compare what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Did you utilize that technique within nursing to make sure that you were doing everything to the best of your ability? Mm -hmm. um, that is probably the biggest thing you have to learn when you're in nursing school and when you get out is that you have to depend on people to tell you how it is. And um, if, you know, because you are supposed to know and you are supposed to exude confidence, but you, but you really don't. And so you have, to, you have to rely on people to have your back. And so if you don't know, you, you need to have that relationship with somebody that, that you can say, hey, I have no idea what I'm doing here, can you help me out? And not feel bad about asking that. Because one of the other things is that I, I always thought that I should know it all and I should be independent and I should be able to go do this, but you really can't. And in, in life too, you just have to have somebody there that'll say to you, you know what, you know, maybe you might wanna kind of change your tactics a little bit or do something a little bit differently. So I, I think you really depend on people, both in the Honors College, the you know, people that were in class with me. I mean, you really develop those relationships so that somebody could tell you how it really was. That's amazing. And with um, nursing, the science world is always changing. There's always something new coming out. Mm -hmm. Are you still developing your skills as you're going and are you still learning as oh, yeah. you go? Oh yeah, I think that's in anything but it really is in nursing because, or in medicine, because there's always two drugs that do different things. There are always diseases that they 
didn't find before that they have now. Um, you know, and so I think that any time, and part of the, part of being keeping my license is I'm supposed to do so many continuing education units and keep up to date on things. But I, I think that you're not a good nurse or you're not good in any job unless you continue to think that there's something to learn. Mm -hmm. Because if there's not if there's nothing to learn, then you know what are you doing? Do you like that education aspect of it? I do. I do. Good. I enjoy looking at um, conferences, going to conferences, learning from other people. And then the other thing is that's always nice is there's tons of conferences and tons of meetings in Houston. But those are all the same people that are in the Texas Medical Center of the Houston area. It's really nice to go somewhere else, to another city and get a bigger perspective from people that maybe work in California or maybe work in somewhere else where you know where you can kind of get the different perspective of what they think too so that networking and that learning from each other continues no matter how many years you've worked what cities have you traveled to for your conferences and for your oh, a lot of different cities um, Chicago and um, different cities in Texas as well but there have been conferences in Florida there have been conferences in Philadelphia just all kinds of different places do you ever visit any of your friends that you met in college while you're at these conferences? Yes. Yeah. In fact, I'm visiting two of them while I'm here. That is awesome. Yeah. May I ask their names? Um, I'm visit um, um, somebody named Mike, who is a really good friend of both um, my husband Steve and mine, and then um, my former roommate Paula. That's awesome. So mm -hmm. you still remain close to your roommate that mm -hmm. you had while you were here yeah. at Ball State. Mm -hmm. Were you roommates with Paula all four years? I was roommates with Paula, um, the and I was roommates with Paula for three years, and then I was roommates with um, Vicky, who is a physician in Ohio, in my last year. That's awesome. Are you still close to Vicky as well? I am. That's wonderful. So you've remained friends with all of these people that you've met throughout mm -hmm. your college experience? Mm -hmm. I have. Aww. And then can you tell me a little bit more about like any awards that you've gotten through your nursing experience and through your administration experience? So um, recently I just took the, I, I have two certifications that I just got. Um, one is called the Fellowship of American College of Healthcare Executives. Um, that was a brutal test, um, so you have to study and you have to get so many credits, and then you have to, and then you get you qualify to take the test. So I just got that um, three months ago, and then also through the Healthcare Finance Management Association, I have a um, clinical um, certification in business management. So on the on the clinical side. Awesome. And have you been recognized by um, Texas Medical Center, any of the other hospitals? Yeah, I had a, um, I, I got honored as um, one of the salute to nurses, and so kind of the top nursing in the city of Houston, and that was four years ago. Four and, years ago. Yep, for administration at um, Shriners. That is awesome. So with that, do you think that your efforts kind of, like, inspire other nurses or other faculty to follow in your footsteps or have you noticed that with anyone? So I hope so. Um, I don't know if I've noticed it or not. I mean I do think that in my role as an administrator and a nurse I think that you always have to be aware of people are always watching you and I hope that I inspire people to to be better nurses um, and to maybe learn and continue to grow in the administrative world if that's what they want. I'm also hoping that, you know, I'm not working forever, so I'm really hoping that, you know, there are people in the hospital that would really like to learn from me and maybe step up into my role when I'm not, when I'm not working anymore. Um, so kind of that mentoring part of, um, I hope that, that they see that and want that, and I hope that I make that, you know, I influence people that way. That's awesome. Have you noticed anybody that you would want to see yourself taking in as, you know, maybe a mentee? Yeah, there are, there, the are, there are one or two people in the hospital right now that I think um, could really do it, um, but they, they are very clinically oriented, more on the nursing side. Um, it's kind of odd to have an administrator who's a nurse. 
Um, so, you know, administrators are more business oriented and, and um, people laugh at me all the time because they say, well, we can't get away with anything because you know too much. And I said, that's true because I do know how it affects patient care and, and I do know I'm not so far removed from the patient care aspect that as an administrator, but I think there are people that could learn the administrative side. Um, but I think that there's two sides, at least for me, there's two sides of the job. I really like the fact that I know what's going on clinically with patients, but I also really like the fact that I, I think I've learned the administrative side and it's, it's a good way to um, kind of blend my role. So when I'm looking for someone that I could mentor, the clinical side, they probably know, they probably don't know the administrative side, so that's what I need to help them with, if that's what they want to do. Um, some people don't want to do it, so you have to identify them first. With administration I, and with clinical care, there's typically a mindset shift between the two. Mm -hmm. What's that like for you? I have to go back and forth um, because, I mean, I'll give you an example. We have... I have I hold town hall meetings and I communicate with the staff probably on an every other month basis. So we talk about what's going on in you know the world and what's happening in the hospital. And so um, after one town hall, um, one of the nurses came up to me and said, "Do you think maybe you could continue to?" She said, "All you talk about are finances and you talk about what the budget looks like and you talk about." you know, what the plans are. She said, you forgot that we take care of patients too. And I thought, that is so true. I forgot that, you know, the patient's in the picture. And, you know, I used to tell stories about how well we did with patients. And then, then I went to the town hall and I'm telling everybody all about the administrative side of the work. And, I, and so I do have to make that shift periodically and make sure that I can, um, I can continue to see both sides of it. How do you balance that out for yourself? Oh, I, I think it gets balanced out for me. Um, there are times where I have to concentrate on the administrative side. I mean, budget becomes very important. Economics becomes very important. Healthcare overall, um, it's just changing so quickly. And so, yes, what we do in healthcare and what we do with our finances, is, especially at Shriners, the more the better we do with our dollars the more patients we can take care of so you always have to go back to that but there are some times where it doesn't really matter what's going to happen with the patient because i have to get us through a health care change that has to happen and so sometimes it's decided for me understandable with that exponential growth that's experienced in the medical field and with it ever growing and ever changing how do you keep yourself up to pace with everything? I read a lot. Um, there's, you know, always magazines that that come out, and and I think I have a really good relationship with the physicians. So on the clinical side, I keep up to date with what they're doing and the changes that they're making and how their practice is going. Um, so that's kind of helps me on the clinical side. On the administrative side, I read a lot. Okay. And kind of tying this back into your schooling, uh -huh. you mentioned that a lot of your science-based classes, as we both know, are very black and white, very factual-based. Mm -hmm. Honors college and literature classes are very conceptual and mm -hmm. based on your own perception. Right. Do you see those two elements work together in the hospital for you at all? Or is it just very black and white? Like, Do you see like, no, patient relations? No, I think that the whole... Um, that whole interrelationship, socialization part of um, what you learn in the Honors College, I think that comes into play every single day when you take care of patients because there's a whole component of patient care and administration that is very, how do I put it, kind of global and kind of cloudy, if you will. Um, so there aren't any black and white answers a lot of times. And so I think both of them come into play. I think that it's probably more um, you just do what you feel like you need to do. There's really no right or wrong answer. And I think that's where 
the Honors College and those kind of courses really make a difference for me. Do you see other people that come in and are new to the medical experience struggling with this at all? I think, I don't think we're very nice to people that come into the medical field. I think that our, we set expectations for people coming into medicine or coming into the hospital and we think that they should be able to come in and do everything and do it our way. And there's a whole lot of different ways you can do things, but we, we are not very nice to new people coming into the, into the field. Um, we make it very difficult for them. And so what happens is they stop asking questions and they start, stop asking for help. And then they fail and you have no idea, you know, that you helped them fail because you didn't help them succeed. Do you see any way around this issue and this barrier? Well, first of all, I think that you have to, there have to be people that know um, how to take care of, that know how to precept, know how to orient people and are patient with it. Um, and then you have to use them to the best of your ability. But I think you have to catch it when it happens. I think you have to say, hey, you know, we can't let this go on because you can't, you can't keep losing new people. Because again, in, in medicine, there's too many other places they can go. That's very true. All right, and then you'd mentioned previously that you were in the middle of building a family, that you had a lot of issues and you were taking a lot of your home, like your um, mm -hmm. work life home with you and it was a little bit hard to balance. How did you find that balance with your husband working at, um, as? Athletic director. Yeah, yeah. athletic director. Um, Actually, I, I found it probably by going to Shriners. There's a much better work-life balance there. Um, it's a little bit easier to manage um, being able to leave at a certain time and go take care of kids. Um, my youngest one was, I was working at Memorial Hermann and um, I was working over the, the PDICU and the pediatric transplant. And I picked her up from, from daycare and she was two and a half years old, three years old. And my pager went off. And you know what she said? She said, that's the PICU and they need a nurse. And I said, you know, there's something really wrong with that. She shouldn't have to know that I'm constantly on the phone dealing with staffing issues. And so I think that I did look for a place that would help me balance work and life and home and, and do it better than I was obviously doing it. Do you think that influenced your decision to move over into Shriners? I think it did, a lot, a lot. Besides the fact that I can learn more, and it was a promotion for me, and it was a great opportunity, but I think it helped a lot knowing that I could probably do a better work-life balance. Working in pediatrics, I know that it's very easy to be very heavy with the things that you see and take a lot of it home with you. Having a young daughter, and as you said, she was two and a half when mm -hmm. you were still working there. Mm -hmm. Was that something that was hard for you to manage? Oh yeah, my kids will tell you all the time. Um, we saw a lot of kids in, when the big TVs came out, we saw uh, like three children in a row in our PDICU that had crawled up on the TV stand and the TVs had fallen over on them. And so I, I would go home and say, well, we're never getting this TV, we're never doing this. Or somebody would fall off a swing set and they'd hit their head. Nope, we can't have a swing set. Uh, my kids tell me all the time it was awful because you'd come home from the ICU and you'd say, nope, we're not doing this, we're not doing this, we're not doing this because of the things that I would see in the ICU. Do you think that that may have hindered their upbringing? No, <laughs> they will tell you no. <laughs> in fact, they will tell you I went exactly the opposite way. When they started, when they would fall and they would get hurt and they would go, oh, my wrist hurts. And nine times out of ten, it would probably be broken, and I just would go, oh, I've seen worse. And so they, they joke all the time now that I'm just the worst mother because I'm a nurse and I've always seen worse. I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you had a mom who was a nurse, you would understand that, yes. She worked in the ER for ten years. Oh, so, yeah, if something <laughs> happened to you, uh, I've seen worse. Yep. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, um, like, how do I want to word this? 
Do you think that there's anything that you would have necessarily changed about working in the pediatrics along with having young kids at the time, or was that something that you enjoyed doing? I did. I, I needed, um, I, I really liked pediatrics, like I told you from the very beginning, but um, I needed to work. I was not going to be a very good stay-at-home mom. And so working in an area that was fulfilling to me, I think helped me when I actually got home. Yes, it was hard to juggle, but I think I was a better person because of it, because I was able to work and, and, and then go home and take care of the kids. Shriners, you had said, made it a little bit easier to balance your mm -hmm. work life. How did your life change after you had started working at Shriner? Um, well, I learned, I, it was a different job, so I was excited about learning a different job, and so I think my attitude was better, but I also think that um, I knew that if I needed to go pick up my child, or if, you know, Andrea or Allie were sick or something, I could stay home with them, and it wasn't such pressure to always be at work and always, you know, be on top of everything. Um, it was a little bit less intense, and I think that that um, really made a difference. Do you think your children noticed the difference as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they'll tell you that they did. Right. And then overall, how do you think that your collegiate experience has flowed into your work life? I think the ability to talk to different types of people, to still be interested in kind of where people have come from and how they got where they are and also the ability to set priorities and have schedules and be able to complete multiple projects um, I think has made a big difference for me. Um, and that's what I learned in college. I learned to, you know, um, set some priorities and how to talk to people and how to um, communicate, I think, better or more clearly. And I think I take that even now um, as I, you know, work now. So I think a lot of those skills that you learn in college, going from small to big and different and, you know, kind of overwhelming, and then taking it down to kind of the chewable chunks so that you knew what you could do and, and get it all done, I think um, that carries over to today all the time. How do you think that those soft skills play with hard skills within? What oh, I think you now? have to know when to use soft skills and when to use hard skills. Um, my staff will tell you that I have a very, um, I have a voice that it's, they call it my, my mother voice. They know that they're in trouble when I, when I use that voice or they know that I'm serious when I use that voice. But I think you have to have that mix of soft and hard skills in the world and wherever you are, and I think that, I think that's one of the things you learn as you, as you grow, but I think it's also one of the things you learn as you interact with different types of people, too. That's very true. And then, do you see all of this, like, what I've gathered is you're very tenacious, you're very hardworking, you have a plethora of skills that you are willing to give out to those who are mm -hmm. willing to come to you. Where do you see yourself going within your career at this moment? Okay, so you're going to think this is really weird, um, but I'll, I'll tell you. I am, um, I told you I'm old, and so I really would like to finish my career with what I'm doing and retire from Shriners as an administrator, and hopefully I leave it in a better place than when I got it. But I don't want to end there um, because I don't think I could be one of those people that stays at home all the time. Um, but I don't think I want to do nursing. So I tell everybody I, there are two things I want to do when I retire from Shriners. I either want to go work at the Houston Zoo, which I think would be so much fun because I think the zoo is very much like the hospital, only the patients don't talk back or the animals don't talk back to you. They just probably bite you. But other than that, uh, either that or I want to go work at Southwest Airlines and put people on airplanes. I fly Southwest. I fly Southwest all the time. <laughs> and I have such a good time when I'm at Southwest, so I just go, that's what I want to do. What influenced those two very different decisions of post 
administrative career? I, d I think just because I think that it would be, I think it would be fun to go to Southwest Airlines and again, meet different kinds of people and see different people at different you know, places in their life, getting on planes for different reasons and having the ability to make a difference because that's one of the things that I see Southwest is doing is, you know, if, if there's somebody who's upset, then they can do something about it and they can help them and they can take that initiative to do that. And so to me, I just think that would be fun. And, and it would be something that you go home at night and you don't worry about. You know, there's nothing that's over your head that you have to worry about that you're gonna come to the next day. You know, you put the people on the plane and the plane goes. And if it doesn't go and they're upset, hey, I take care of upset people all the time. I can do that. And then the animals, I just think the animals are stress-free and very relaxing and you know, anything you do for an animal, it's great, so. I know, aren't I, I know I'm weird, but I love it. My kids just laugh at me and they go, really? You're going to go work at Southwest Airlines? I say, yeah, I am. I see that selfless humanitarian aspect of you kind of coming out in both of those options. Do you see yourself pursuing something in that selfless aspect? Is that something that like, you want to continue doing, being caring for others and making sure that you have that mom feel to it? Yeah, I think I do. I think, and I think that's why I chose the two things I did. I'll probably never work at Southwest Airlines because apparently there's all kinds of people lined up to work there. So I probably will have to get in line, but I bet the zoo could use me. I think they could too. <laughs> and then as we wrap up our time today, is there any additional information or stories that you'd like to share with me about your Ball State or your Honors College experience? I don't think so. I don't think so. I still, I do have to tell you though, I come back here and I don't come back here very often, um, but I come back here and it still has the same feel. You know, it's still a good place. And I think that all, you know, and I told you, I, I made it sight unseen, made the decision sight unseen, but it was a really great decision for me. And I think, you know, obviously I met my husband here, so it's a whole different, you know, who knows what would have happened if I wouldn't have come here. But I just think it's just a, you know, it's just a great place to be, and I, I am really glad that I was able to have all these experiences and get where I am today. Is there anything that you think you would have done differently looking back on your experience now that you are in your position? I don't think so. I don't think so. All right. Well, with that, we will be concluding our interview today. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to share your stories with me for the Ball State University Honors College Oral History Project. And it was a great pleasure to meet with you and learn more about your experience. Oh, thank you. It was nice meeting you too. Thank you.